that Dr. Luke had the privilege to pen for us. And these first few verses are going to speak about uh, a man. This, this is a change up. In the book of Acts, we're going to see almost like Acts in a play. And we've come to the end of one in chapter 5, and we're picking up a new one in chapter 6. And the character here is going to be Stephen. And then the next act, we're going to see a guy by the name of Philip. But they make their appearance here. And they're going to speak to us about a quality of life that is respected. So let me just read uh, the first uh, few verses to you. He says, now in those days, and he's talking about the days of the church in all of its growth. When the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Let me just remind you that we've seen this time and time again already in the book of Acts, that when God began to work and the lost began to be saved and people's lives began to be changed, that Satan sought to destroy that by diminishing their numbers and that God would work in spite of it. And when he could not defeat them from the outside, he always sent somebody to the inside. We've seen it with Ananias and Sapphira. We're now seeing it between the Hebrews and the Greeks. And there's a conflict, and it's over money. Money is one of those things that has destroyed so many churches and ruined the reputation of so many churches. And we see it that it began all the way back here in, in Acts chapter 4, 5, and 6. It keeps raising its head. Verse 2 says, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. You see, that's what Satan is always after. He's after getting us off of our knees because he doesn't want us to pray. And he wants to get us out of the word because he doesn't want us to hear truth. And here he is in this second verse trying to destroy those in the church on their knees praying in the word of God, studying and teaching. He was trying to disrupt that and bring it to a stop. Verse 3, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Look at verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We learn from this passage that we need to hear from God before we speak to men about God. Well, let's just stop right there for a moment and let's see what these verses have to say to us this morning about a good man and about a good life. A good life is, as I've said, is a life that is respected. If there's anything that a man desires in life, it is to be respected. When we get to the book of Ephesians and it speaks about a man loving his wife as he loves himself. And yet he turns to the woman and says, you are to respect your husband. A disrespected man is a broken hearted man. A man who gives what he can and does as much as he can with the abilities, talents, or even the lack of. And to be disrespected for his effort will break a man's heart. It will break his will. It will crumble him. It will crush him. The story is told of the famous uh, singer Bill Gaither. That when he went to, back to his hometown after college, he and his wife wanted to build a home and they had no land and they found a place that they liked and 
they found out who owned it, and it was an elderly gentleman. He was about 92 years old. And they went and they saw him. And uh, they asked him, and they said, we'd like to buy a piece of your land. And he just abruptly told them, no, I don't have any for sale. They were saying their farewells to go out the door, and the man said, well, tell me your name once again. And he told him his name, that his name was Bill Gaither, William Gaither. He said, are you any kin to Grover? And he said, yes, sir, Grover was my grandfather. He said, Grover used to work for me. He farmed for me on some of the land that I owned. He said he was a pretty good fellow. Matter of fact, he was probably the best fellow that ever worked for me. I respected your granddad. Bill said they left, and a week later, this man called him back and said, you know, I never did anything real good for your grandfather, so I'll do it for you. I'll sell you that piece of land that you had asked me about. Bill said that laid in his heart for 30 years. And 30 years later, he looked at his son and he said, Son, you were raised here and had all the benefits of this place. And it was nothing that you earned. It was all because of a man you never met, your great-grandfather. We never know how far of a reach our reputation is going to have. We never know how many generations it's going to reach and touch. Our reputation of being a good man is the most valuable thing that you have, men. And we need to take the time to make sure that it's a reputation that God has built. Because you and I do not know where God is going to take our life or the story of our life and who he's going to reach with it. We only see what we can see right here around us. But what God sees is even generations beyond us. You sitting here today, you may let your mind roam back and you may think about a grandparent or a great-grandparent that you had the privilege to meet maybe only briefly for a year or two years three years whatever and yet they left a lasting impression upon you their character their reputation who they are as a godly person still comes creeping back into your life even today and you're reminded of something they said or the way that they lived. And it affects your life today. So let's take a look at what's being said here. There was a, a problem in the church. The church was growing so fast and the money that had been given by people like Barnabas, they were reaching out with it and using it to buy groceries for this widow and that widow, to buy a meal, to pay, do this and to do that. And it just got to be more than the apostles could do. And they wound up that instead of praying and teaching and preaching the Word of God, that they were constantly going from house to house and meeting needs. And even at that, they could not get around to everybody because they still had their church work to do, the the teaching of the Word of God and the time that they spent praying. And so there became a struggle. And here it is said that they gathered and they said, but let's just get 12 men that will do that for us. Seven men, excuse me, seven men that will do that for us. And those seven men, it's, it's, it's interesting that they were all Greeks. They were not Hebrews. This is not a ministry of the church that the apostles felt like they had to dominate. And they simply gave it. The Greeks are, were the squeaky wheel, so here you take the job and do it. But you've got to be a man of certain character. And he says that they had to be men who had a good reputation. If you would, go with me 
to verse 3, he said, I want you to seek out. He speaks to the church. He speaks to the Hebrews, the Greeks. I want you to seek out from among your own self, your own mankind, your own brothers, seven men of good reputation. A good reputation consists of godly character, which is produced by being controlled. And in this case, it's controlled by the Holy Spirit. The good reputation is what they were looking for. And he said it was men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this matter. The first thing that they were looking for in this character was a man who had surrendered himself to the total will of God. They were going to be trusting them with money. And this was not to be, well, this is my friend and this is my family and I, this is a Greek and not a Hebrew. No, they were looking for men that were full of the Holy Spirit who were surrendered to God, who looked at people not based on their nationality, not based on their income, not based on where they came from, the color of their skin or the language that they spoke, but they were looking into the hearts of those men and women, in this case specifically women, widows who were without. They were looking into their lives and saying this is just a need, and they heard the Holy Spirit say this one needs, this one needs, and that one needs. So they were men that were led not by their own desires or their own ambitions or their own goals or their own financial gain or their reputation as being a leader in the church that was laid aside and they were surrendering themselves to God on a daily basis allowing God to be the director of their lives. Dad's... To be a, the dad that God wants you to be, it means giving up a lot. It means surrendering your life that you may give to these that God has placed in your life. And as a father, you know that fatherhood is not just for 18 years. You're a father for life. Those children will always look to you, will always ask you, will always want to hear what you have to say. They'll be looking for somebody that can speak to them, not based on, hey, I'm your son and I deserve whatever, but a guy that will look into their lives and led by the Spirit of God, be able to speak truth into your child's life. Even when that child is grown and is a father of their own, to still be able to speak truth into that child's life takes a father that is surrendered to God to be able to say, Son, this is what God's Word says. And this is what I'll have to hold to. That's hard to tell a child in our culture today when the culture is pressing upon us to change and to be molded to look like our culture itself. To be able to stand and simply say, but this is what God's Word says. And the culture will come and it will go and it will change and it always has. But God's word will never change. Those are not easy words to speak to your family. And yet a godly man, a man of good reputation, a man full of the Holy Spirit, will surrender his tongue and his heart to the very spirit of God that he may speak the good things into a child's life, that he may speak the hard things into a child's life and yet do it with love I love you son I love you daughter I love you with all my heart this is what God's Word says and this is where I will have to stand and we let God do the work from there but he doesn't just say full of the Holy Spirit because we could we could abuse that statement but he says full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. You see, a good reputation consists of godly character, which is produced by the possession of godly wisdom. 
And godly wisdom doesn't just fall from the air. It is something that is gained. The guy that we're going to be studying about in these two chapters, his name is Stephen. And Stephen comes from the Greek word Stephanos. And Stephanos is one of the two Greek words for a crown. There was a diadem, which is a crown that is of royalty. It is a crown that you cannot earn. It is a crown that must be inherited. You see, you can't earn. God is your heavenly father. You inherit it when God makes you his child. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, you become a child of God. That's an inheritance. And with that inheritance comes all that God possesses. He tells us in the epistles, it is inherited. You cannot go out and work and earn that relationship of being a child of God. It is a gift that God gives to us. But the Stephanos crown was, a, was also known as a victor's crown. It would be given to those who had labored, maybe a soldier who had fought in battle and had fought faithfully might be given a Stephanos, a victor's crown. He would earn that. We come to this man named Stephen who bears that name, Stephanos. And we find that the wisdom is something that he earned, something that he worked for. Something that he labored for. Something that he put in time for. If you want the wisdom of God, you're going to have to put your time in. You're going to have to give your time to prayer. Let's go back and look at what the apostle said. We're going to give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word of God. Our time. Time is what it takes to become a father that has wisdom, godly wisdom, wisdom worth sharing with a child, wisdom that is eternal, wisdom that is the very word of God, wisdom that is the power of God, wisdom that will change a person's life. It takes putting in the time. You say, preacher, I'm already busy. Well, then we need to ask the hard, hard question. Am I busy with the wrong things in life? They may not be bad things, but they're just not the best things for me to be busy with. I want to take you for a moment on down to verse 8 as we think about this possession of the wisdom of God and the necessity of it in our character of having a good reputation or a good name. In verse 8, and it said, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Once again, it speaks of the fullness that is within this man. He's full of grace. He's full of faith. He's full of power. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He's full of the wisdom of God. It is that work that he's doing. And he's, it's being manifested through the very actions of his life. I don't know what all Stephen was doing. But everything that he seemed to touch, it seemed to leave the imprint of God upon it. Every person that he speaks to, every deed that he does, his very family, it seems to be imprinted with the very presence of God because he is a man that is full of the Holy Spirit. He surrendered to God, therefore he surrendered to be obedient to God, and God is filling his mind with the word that he is studying. Now remember, he only has what you and I know as the Old Testament. He doesn't have these gospels that you and I have. He doesn't have this acts of the apostles. It's being, he's actually being part of the writing because they're writing about him. So he has this Old Testament that he is studying and it is coming out in everything that he says and everything that he does. 
He is fulfilling the words that maybe he heard Jesus speak some words like we find in John chapter 14. Let me just read you one verse. He says in the verse 12 of John 14, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. You see, he's filled with the wisdom of God, and Stephen is believing what he has been told and what's been preached to him. And maybe he's heard these verses. Maybe he heard Jesus say them himself. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You see, Stephen is a man full of wisdom. The wisdom of God. The Word of God. And he speaks that word into his family and into his acquaintances and into his job. He speaks it into his ministry and he proclaims that word. If you follow down from verse 8, we see the character of Stephen as it's manifested as even more. It says that there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. Disputing with Stephen, verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. We find that Stephen was not a man who spoke from the flesh. There is a difference. When we as Christians speak from the flesh, people can resist what we have to say. They can even mock us. But when we are full of the Holy Spirit of God and full of His wisdom, and we speak from that power, then the lost are not able to resist that word. Jesus said, you're going to do greater works than me. You simply need to ask. Stephen was a man who was willing to ask God because he could not do it himself. That's hard for us as men to come to. We have to get down off of our horse of pride and our horse of arrogance and our horse of self-righteousness if we're going to be a man like Stephen. Have you ever heard the term outsourcing? It's the business of taking something that you need in your business and hiring somebody outside of your company to do that. Maybe you don't have the manpower to do it. Maybe it's more than your company can afford to do right now. Power companies will outsource the building of power lines to uh, contractors because it's more than the local power company has the manpower to do. People will outsource things like printing because they do not have the capability within their office to print the product that they need printed. You catch on to what I'm saying. You're familiar with the idea of outsourcing something to another company. You hire somebody to do a job because you simply do not have the manpower or the facility or the ability or the equipment to do what's needed. It's done all over the world. When we look at Stephen... And being a man of good reputation. We find that somewhere in Stephen's life. He had to recognize. That he did not have within him. What it would, was needed. To be a man. With a good reputation. Stephen looked at himself as Paul and others did. And all they could see in the mirror was a failure. 
a sinner, somebody who stumbled over every little rock and pebble of temptation, somebody who seemed to go back and commit the same sins over and over and over again, and as much as they tried, they just were not making it. They were not getting there. They were not accomplishing this, this godly life. Their temper would flare. Their attitude of ugliness and rudeness would show up. And they built a reputation of a jackal and a hide. They're one thing over here and something else over here. They're one thing in public and something else behind closed doors. At some point, Stephen saw that in himself. He saw the inadequacy of his own self to accomplish and be the man of God that God wanted out of him. And so Stephen outsourced that. At some point, he, as he read those scriptures and he read about people like Noah and Moses, he read about people like Joseph, he read about people like old Jacob. Something was said in one of our songs or, or scriptures or something about the God of Jacob. Jacob was a lying, scheming, conniving individual. I don't know that that'd be a great thing to put on your business card. I'm, I'm the God of this lying, cheating guy over here for 20 years. He's cheated his uncle and his uncle has cheated him. And, you know, you wouldn't want to trade goats with them to save your life. You'd be like a used car salesman here. You know, it's, but yet Jacob had the meeting with God. You know, you've heard of come to Jesus meetings. He had that out there where he wrestled with the angel. You see, Jacob had to see himself as inadequate as a reckless, reckless individual. He had to outsource all of that to God, and he cries out to God, I, you know, I can't do this, but God, I want to be blessed by you. I want to be your man. Stephen, at some point in his life, realizes, God, I can't do all of this, and I need something more. I need to be full of the Holy Spirit to be this godly man. And Father, the Holy Spirit belongs to you. And all I can do is surrender. And Lord, I need to be knowledgeable and full of your word. I need the wisdom of God so that I can say to those who come to me in their struggles, this is what God's word says and God is always true. And I need to live it myself. Handing out Biblical information and not living it yourself is known as hypocrisy. And Stephen didn't want to be a hypocrite any longer. He wanted to be a man of God. And so he outsources that to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit then teaches him, reveals to him, opens up to him the Word of God, and he finds himself with thoughts and answers to questions, and he realizes they did not come from himself, but they came from the Spirit of God. Stephen surrenders himself to that power. He outsources his Christian life, his reputation to the Spirit of God and says, I'm not capable of doing this. I don't have the equipment. You're going to have to do this with me, for me, in me, and through me. And Stephen becomes that man that we read of in the, that 10th verse that I may read it to you again. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. They could resist him. <laughs> They're going to stone him here in the next chapter. But they could not resist the spirit of God or the wisdom by which he spoke to them. Stephen's reputation as a good man is still alive today 2,000 years later. 
I guess the question we need to ask, if this old world was to last another 2,000 years, would it, what would your reputation still have feet on which to stand? Or would we all be forgotten like dust in the wind? Fathers, I would challenge you to reach for the goal of being like Stephen. Not a rich man. If God gives you money, be wise with it. The love of it is the root of all evil. We see that time and time again right here in the book of Acts. Education, they come and go. It's sad to get a doctor's degree and then get dementia and lose it all. But what your children will never forget about you is the spirit within you and the wisdom within you. They will take that with them and pass it on to every generation that they are able to touch. Let me tell you about my dad. Let me tell you what my dad said. There are words that your father will say to you in your life that God will engrave upon your heart and mind and you will remember them till the day that you die. The words that you want to engrave in your children's lives are words of life, words of grace, words of love, words of truth, words of wisdom that can come only from God. You don't have that within you. You're going to need to outsource that job to the Spirit of God. And He can make you a man or woman just like Stephen. Reputation, good or bad, it's earned. It's not inherited. You've got to build it. And God's ready to build it in your life. And he's inviting you to come and join him because he wants to build a mighty structure in your life. The question is, will you let him? My Father in heaven, bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Thank you for Stephen, a man who surrendered to you, who quit thinking about what am I going to be and what books am I going to write and where's my name going to be and who's going to know who I am. He became a man that was full of the Holy Spirit and full of your wisdom. And it made him a servant, Father. He was a genuine servant. If we want to be your servant, then the, the qualifications are filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with the wisdom, the Word of God, and living it by your power. Heavenly Father, I pray that for every man and woman, boy and girl in this room. That we would be more caught up in being full of you than anything else in this world. And Father, I ask it in Jesus' name today. Amen. I'm going to